Thank you, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I can't see with these lights, so I don't know who's here, but it's a big crowd. I'm not going to make another joke like I did last week about, last year, about his, any, what 70-year-old would be worried about crowd size. Uh, what? And, and, and is there something going on today that you may be interesting beside me? Is there something on TV this afternoon? The trial's over. Trump's been acquitted. They'll have the trial next week. Uh, <laughs> all right, that's enough of that. Okay, uh, but uh, it's really great to be back. Thank you, uh, uh, Roberta. I want to thank the library staff, too, Aaron and TJ and John, really helpful. My wife for orchestrating the seating here. Uh, but most of all, you people, you don't know how good this makes me feel. I don't know after what I've been through how long I have to go, but th this is the highlight of my year, really. Really, really, truly it is. Uh, the only, I'm a worry work. The only thing that worries me if the crowd ever dies down, I don't know what I'll do. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I don't have to forget now on Thursday. I already said it. All right. Oh. Uh, no, I get excited at the end, and then uh, uh, other things used to get me excited, now making announcements. Uh, it, it's always great great to get old. Whoever said that is a lying ass. Okay. Uh, but anyway, all right. So we're going to talk about today the, the rise of the Republican Party. I just want to give you a little background that some people don't seem to comprehend. Though. Why do we have a two-party system? There's nothing in the Constitution. If I hear about the Constitution one more time today, jeez, uh, uh, I wonder how many of those guys and women actually read the Constitution. Probably neither side, yeah. All right, it would take five minutes. Uh, they're too busy. All right, but anyway, why a two-party system? There's nothing in the Constitution that says we have to have a two-party system. There would be some advantages if we had a multi-party system. I, I used to be totally against a multi-party system for a lot of reasons. Now I'm beginning to waver a little bit. Uh, yeah, but, but anyway, I still basically think we're better served by a two-party system. If you think we have gridlock and confusion in Washington now with two parties, what would it be with five or six? I mean, it would be complete and utter and unmitigated chaos. All right, but why do we have a two-party system? One thing that's a little fake news is our weather. There used to be a theory that if you have a moderate climate, changeable weather, most of the country, not really here, but most of the country has winter and uh, spring and summer and fall. And uh, there is a theory that uh, a, a moderate climate and a changeable climate makes people more moderate more compromising. You look at Africa, Central America, the places that are more humid and hot, uh, they tend to have very volatile politics, cutthroat, as we don't. Uh, but, uh, but, but anyway, supposedly more moderate climates like us, England, Canada, tend to make people more compromising. And a two-party system, by definition, uh, will be more compromising than a multi-party system. And no more jokes about what's going on now. But that's probably not true. Uh, it's somewhat true, but you could always poke holes in that one. So I, I, that one's partly true, but not completely. Our, here's more important, our British and colonial heritage. We were 13 original British colonies. And by 1776, when we declared our independence, England had developed uh, more or less a two-party system, which they have until today. And you always copy your parents, basically. We used to have a, a Lithuanian saying, can't make a canary out of a crow. And if your mother's 300 pounds, your father's 400 pounds, don't make plans to be a jockey. So uh, <laughs> we, uh, yeah. Uh, and, 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 and like us in Canada, and you know, in Canada, uh, what's the difference between a canoe and a Canadian? A uh, canoe tips once in a while. Uh, I had a lot of waitresses and bartenders in class. I'm sorry, I don't know. But don't worry, the royal couple's moving there now, so everything is going to be fine. All right. Uh, the, the English had developed the two-party system, which they still have, and by 1776, every one of the 13 colonies, just about, you could argue Georgia maybe not, but at least 12 of the 13 colonies had a two-party system. So we just naturally then went on to a two-party system after independence. For example, Pennsylvania, from whence I come, 
Uh, Pennsylvania had the proprietary party that wanted to keep the Pens in command, and the anti-proprietary party led by Benjamin Franklin that wanted to strip the power away from the Pens, compensate them, and then uh, have a non-proprietary situation. In, 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 New, in, uh, in uh, New York, you had a, a kind of a conflict between the city politicians and the upstate politicians, which you still do. Uh, so more or less, we, we kind of naturally evolved into a two-party system. But here are the main reasons. We have, and these, I don't want to get too uh, long-winded, but we have single-member, simple plurality districts, or single-member winner-take-all districts. We do not have proportional elections. That's why I have that in boldface. Uh, in the United States, to my knowledge, every single election, on every level, right up to president, you either win or not. There's no compensation for finishing second. Close only counts in making love in horseshoes. It doesn't count. That one didn't go over. I'll edit it out next year. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, the single member winner take you either win or you go home. That's it. Uh, for example, it, we only have 435 congressional districts. But let's say we had 500. If the Republicans won every one of those 500 districts, 5149 they would get all 500 seats in the Congress, right? But if we had proportional elections, like most European countries do, not England, that's another reason they maintain the two-party system. In a proportional election, it varies from country to country, but you don't always vote, or you don't vote for a candidate, you vote for a party. And whatever percentage of votes that party gets nationwide, that's the percentage they get in the parliament. So, for example, if that happened in the United States with 500, and it was 5149 Republicans all over, the Republicans would get about 253 seats, and the Democrats, what, 247? Is that am I right? My math right? No. Close. I, I made it 500. Okay. I'm, then I'm trying to go back to 435. Yes. Yeah, so th then the Democrats would at least get 247 seats. So you would you would have an incentive to go forward because you're winning. Right? If you lose all the time, uh, there's no incentive to go on. It's like rooting for the Baltimore Orioles. You know you're going to lose every year. Uh, I used to say Los Angeles Clippers, and they took that away from me. They started to win. I hate them. Okay, uh, but, but anyway, you don't get anything for finishing second. In, in 2000 and 2016, for example, Republicans won the electoral vote, Democrats popular. Did that mean Trump served two, two years and Hillary two years? No. Bush served two years and Al Gore two years? No. If anybody could have done that, it would have been Al Gore and George Bush. Though, if it, uh, but, uh, but, but anyway, you get nothing for for finishing second. It, it's proportional. Right? You do get something for finishing second, even third, even fourth. For example, some European countries like Russia, they have it down to 10%. If you get 10% of the vote nationwide, you get 10% of the seats in Parliament, what they call the Duma. Uh, so uh, we don't. So if you want to have a two-party system, you have single member, simple plurality district, simple member, winner take all. For example, if there are three people running for Congress from our district here, any district, if one, one candidate gets 34% and the other two get 33, who wins? The guy that gets 34, and that's it. He serves the whole two-year term. You don't get anything for getting that close, right? Uh, so it, it, what you have to do when you have single-member, single simple plurality, winner-take-all districts, you have to try to get toward 50%. But plurality means simply get more than anybody else. Plurality, theoretically, could be 2%. If everybody else has 1%, you have 99 candidates, right? But in the United States, we've always, always, always have single member, simple plurality, winner take all districts. And as long as you have that, you're going to have a two party system. You start going to proportional elections like they do in Germany, uh, Russia, to some extent in France, then you're going to have a multi party system. Are there advantages to a multi party system? Yes. But a multi party system without getting intellectual works better in a parliamentary system. We don't don't have a parliamentary system we have a congressional system and in most parliamentary systems you could call elections at any time sometimes two in a year in Israel they're gonna have three in one calendar not a calendar year but a chronological year they're gonna have three we don't we have regularly scheduled elections no matter what happens whether the president or Congress is popular or not you every two years you elect the congressman every uh, certain amount of senators every 
four years you elect the president no matter what. So uh, uh, single member, simple plurality, we are always going to have a two-party system. And without any jokes, I think that serves us better. We have a Congress that's run by committees, uh, and a committee system really works better with the, the fewer parties, the better. And uh, we've never had a really serious threat from a third party uh, in our history. They've never elected a president. Some people say the Republicans that I'm going to talk about today emerge as a third party, but that's not true. The Republicans in the 1850s emerged like an atom bomb. They exploded. They were not only a second party, they were the first party uh, within a couple of years. So to call the original Republicans a third party is not accurate at all. There was a third party at that time called the Know Nothings or American Party, and I'll talk about that very shortly. Now, because we've always had a two-party system, here's how most historians and political scientists break our party eras up. Uh, the first, which lasted, and I'm giving you approximations here, from about 1790 to 1820, we had our first two parties under the Constitution, the Federalists against the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists were more or less the party of Alexander Hamilton, and if I hear his name one more time, uh, Alexander Hamilton and the Democratic Republicans were the party of Thomas Jefferson. They were originally in George Washington's cabinet. He is Secretary of the Treasury. He is Secretary of State, and I I think there's still, Jefferson is still the youngest Secretary of State we ever had, and I believe Hamilton, I know he's the youngest Secretary of Treasury we ever had. But anyway, a party formed around uh, Hamilton, and really, though George Washington said he was apolitical, he was really a Federalist, and the uh, opposition party became the Democratic Republicans. Jefferson preferred to call himself just a Republican. And they battled it out for about 30 years. The Democratic Republicans were more successful. Uh, the Federalists only elected uh, really uh, two presidents, Washington, if you call him one, and then John Adams, uh, who was his successor. And that, that was kind of a disputed election in 1800 when, or 1796 when John Adams won. But they battled it out. And the reason Jefferson tended to like the word Republican better than Democrat, if you go small d, small r, I'm not talking about Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi. If, if you know, what does small r Republican mean? And I don't want to insult anybody. I pledge allegiance to the flag, United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands. I've been doing that for 70 some years. All right, what, what, does, what am I pledging allegiance to? I bet you a lot of people don't know. You're pledging allegiance to a government without a king. A republic in the classic definition is a government that does not have a king, does not usually have a nobility, anybody, any privileged class. Everybody theoretically gets a vote. Whoever they vote in office is in office for a limited time, but it's not a king or an emperor or anything like that. And almost everybody at that time, especially Jefferson, was a Republican. Democrat, and Martha Washington would never use the word Democrat. She thought it was filthy. A Democrat... Uh, small d, a Democrat believes that everybody's equal. Every, everybody should have one vote, every level playing field, everybody's equal. Every man, a pure Democrat, would believe that men and women, gays and straights, old people and young people and in between, they're all equal and everybody's entitled to one vote. Uh, the, 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 the poorest of homeless people is entitled to the same vote as Bill Gates. And that would be a Democrat. And Jefferson felt, even Jefferson, who was much more liberal than Hamilton, Jefferson believed that only the educated elite should vote, whatever that means. In Jefferson's mind, you had to be a college graduate, I guess, which about one-tenth of one percent of all Americans were at that time. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think we fared much better under democracy. Look how smoothly our government runs today. <laughs> So that is why Jefferson, uh, I, I, I can't resist, uh, Jefferson did not like the word Democratic Republican. So some books will refer to Jefferson's party as the Republicans, but really uh, a lot of his really uh, working class followers preferred the word Democratic or the phrase Democratic Republicans. Well, the Federalists faded away and... Uh, by 1820, there was only one party left, the Democratic Republicans. The Federalists really became very weak. What was their final knife in the back was they opposed the War of 1812, which originally was an unpopular war, 
But we thought at the end that we won the War of 1812 because of the Battle of New Orleans, which took place at the end of the war, actually after the war was over, but because the War of 1812 then suddenly became popular, then the Federalists were condemned for having opposed the War of 1812. Kind of weird, because again, the Battle of New Orleans was fought after the peace treaty uh, had been signed. But anyhow, there was a brief period in there called the Era of Good Feelings. In the 1820s, there was really only one party, uh, the Democratic Republicans, and everybody basically claimed to be a Democratic Republican. And many people thought we'd never have a two-party system again. We'd only have a one-party system, hence the era of good political feelings. But that wasn't true. By the end of the 1820s, two new parties had emerged, the Democrats, and they were factions of the dominant Democratic Republican Party, they then split, and the one faction became the Democrats. Uh, by 1828, they were openly using the name Democrat, and that Democratic Party is still with us today. The first Democratic president, the first man who was bold enough to use the word Democrat, was Andrew Jackson. And he was elected in 1828 after being really kind of robbed of the presidency in 1824. But he came back and he won in 1828, and he called himself a Democrat. And Jackson believed that he was not educated. All men are created equally better than every other man. That's the way he put it. Uh, what, Jeff what Jackson should have said is all white men are created equal. He did not like the Indians in particular. He did not think women should be able to vote. Certainly didn't think blacks should since he owned a couple hundred slaves. All right? uh, I don't think Andy was going to give him a vote, 200 to his one. But anyway, the, the Democratic Party formed around Andrew Jackson. By 1832, the Democrats held their first ever quadrennial convulsion, otherwise known as a convention. Uh, and the first Democratic convention ever nominated, guess who? Andrew Jackson for re-election. And believe it or not, since 1832, in good times and bad, the Democrats have never, ever missed a convention. So the Democrats were created in the late 1820s around Andrew Jackson, and they're still with us today. And for many, many years, and I was part of this at one time, the Democrats used to have Jefferson Jackson Day dinners. They are now gone the way of the whooping crane uh, because Jefferson and Jackson both own slaves. Right, so you don't hear that Jefferson Jackson stuff uh, much anymore, but there still are a couple... Uh, uh, areas where they have Democratic fundraisers called the Jefferson Jackson Day Dinners. And then Jackson was so powerful, a Trump-like figure. Uh, Trump is right in a lot of ways to compare himself to Jackson. There are a lot of comparisons to be made. But anyway, Jackson was so powerful, so controversial, so loved, so hated, that a party rose up to oppose him. And they took the name, at first, National Republicans, but they changed their name to Whigs. Now that wig is not something you wear in your head. I would say like Donald Trump, I'm not going to do that. All right, the WHIGS was a party in England. And again, we borrowed this name from the British. Where did the British get the name Whigs? It was an old Irish faction called the Whigamores. And in England, for many, many years, they had a party called the Whigs. So we took that name Whigs. It was, usually the Whigs were opposed to royal authority, opposed to the, pres, uh, the king. So since the Whigs, the National Republicans eventually called Whigs, since they were opposed to King Andrew, who they thought was, he thought, they said he thought he was a king, King Andrew Jackson, thought he could get away with anything. They took the name Whigs to emphasize they opposed the king as the party in England opposed the king. And they battled it out for almost 30 years. Uh, the Democrats got the better of it, but the Whigs were a very competitive party. They elected two presidents. Both of them died in office and were succeeded by Whig vice presidents. So we really, uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, in, eight, uh, in, in 1848, William Henry Harrison in 1840, they were both uh, military generals. But anyway, the Whigs did elect two presidents, many congressmen, many senators. They controlled many states, especially strong in a, the uh, commercially oriented cities. Uh, they would be like the Democrats today. Their, their power base was in the cities. Uh, they were pro-trade. Uh, they favored banking. The Jackson hated banks of any kind. The Whigs not only liked banks, but they liked uh, they wanted a national centralized bank, which they got called the Bank of the United States for many years. All right, and they battled it out, but by the 1850s, the Whigs were in big trouble. Big, big trouble. In 1852, they ran a guy named Winfield Scott, another general, and he only carried uh, 
three or four, I think th four states. He only carried four states. The Whigs took a terrible thumping, and they were really getting deeply, deeply uh, frustrated. Uh, Winfield Scott was a great general, never lost a battle. And when he lost, you know what they said? Now, he, he was a great military general. The Whigs said he lost because he wasn't used to running. <laughs> and he, the guy, the Democrat that beat him, who I'm going to mention in a couple minutes, was Franklin Pierce. Franklin Pierce, right? So you know what the Democrat said? The last successful Democrat before Pierce in 1844 was a guy named Polk, James Knox Polk. And they said, we poked him in 44, we'll pierce him in 52. <laughs> and everybody accused Pierce of being an alcoholic. And sure shooting he was. Just because he walked into walls occasionally at me. Uh, his wife didn't understand. I always told my wife, you don't understand. So, you know, I just test in a wall, see if it's strong enough. All right. But anyway, Pierce was an alcoholic, but a lot of tragedy in his life. Uh, but anyhow, Pierce was also a general during the Mexican War, and ironically, he served under Scott, who he then beat. He was a one-star general. Scott had three stars. But anyway, and Pierce winds up General Pierce beats General Scott. But Pierce, uh, uh, the Democrats said he was the hero of many well-fought battles. But supposedly, at one battle that Pierce fought, a whiskey bottle fell out of his saddlebag. I guess he was saving it for the Mexicans for a little party. All right, uh, uh, but anyway, so the, the Democrats said Pierce is the hero of many well-fought battles, and the Whigs said, yeah, but he's also the hero of many well-drunk bottles. <laughs> if I could come back, I'd really like to be around in 1850. That must have been fun. I know what you're thinking. You just missed it. Who are you kidding? All right, <laughs> so uh, anyway, as my point is going to be, Ever since the 1856 election, it's been the Democrats against the Republicans. So now the question is going to be, after I get through this brief stuff, what caused the rise of the Republican Party, which in essence, in essence, especially in the North, it succeeded the Whigs? Some people, mistakenly, I think, say the Federalists became the Whigs, became the Republicans. Yeah, there's some, there's some argument for that, a lot against it. The Democrats, on the other hand, really could trace their lineage back to Jefferson, though certainly to whom? Certainly to Jackson, right? The Democrats have never missed a convention since the days of Andrew Jackson, and the Democrats are still here today. To say that most of the Whigs, including Abraham Lincoln, most of the Northern Whigs, yes, did become Republicans. They weren't going to become Democrats. So most of them did. And the, really the core of the Republican Party in, in the 1850s was the old Whig Party. All right, but there have been subdivisions of this third two-party system. From eight, here's how most political scientists now break it up. There are some arguments. This is not totally precise. But 95% of political scientists and historians accept this subdivision theory. From 1856 to 1894 was one period. Uh, what changed that? The Republicans were the dominant party. They elected their first president, Lincoln, in 1860, after losing in 1856, barely. And then the Republicans really dominated after that. And then in 1892, the Democrats were lucky enough to elect the president, but then the second worst depression in American history hit. In those days, we didn't call them depressions. We called them panics. And in 1893, there was a panic that lasted the better part of five years. It was the second worst depression in American history, except for the Great Depression of the 1930s. And uh, that really, the Democrats, ironically, were blamed for that, even though their president had only been in office like three months when the Depression hit. But who's ever in office gets to blame. That was with Hoover, whatever. So the Democrats in the elections, off-year elections, of 1890. Incidentally, the Democratic president was Grover Cleveland. When the, Demo in eight, the elections of 1894, the midterms, the Democrats lost 112 seats in the House of Representatives. 112 seats. And there weren't nearly 435 seats at that time. They were only in the 200s or 300s. So the Democrats really, no party ever took a worse shellacking in a midterm election than the Democrats did in 1894. And that ushered in almost 40 years of Republican dominance. Between 1894 and 1932, the Democrats were clearly the second party, 
uh, clearly weak, weaker than the Republicans. In fact, only one Democratic president was elected during that whole period, Woodrow Wilson, who was elected twice in 1912 and 1916, but he only won in 1912 because the Republicans split. You might remember from last year the uh, bull moose thing. I'm going to get into that a little bit tomorrow. Uh, but the, the Republicans were totally dominant. Uh, and if, it, if the Civil War, the coming of the Civil War, if that put the Republicans in a position of dominance, what knocked them out, the second, maybe the second most catastrophic event in American history, the Great Depression. The Great Depression, which began in the fall of 1929, for my family, it's never ended. Uh, so anyway, uh, in 1932, uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was elected the first Democrat since Wilson, and the first Democrat to really win, not on a fluke, as Wilson did in 1912. And really, if I have time, I'll get in. In 1916, Wilson's win was also kind of fluke, even though he's a pretty good president, he barely won re-election. But anyhow, uh, the Great Depression was blamed on the Republicans, just as the Civil War was kind of blamed on the Democrats. So then the, Repu uh, the Democrats began an era of dominance between 1932 and 1970. Think of that. Uh, in 1932, 36, 40, 44, Roosevelt was elected, right, four terms. In 1948, Truman. In 1952 and 56, the Republicans did win, but only because they had the most popular man in American history on their ticket. Eisenhower, he would have beaten anybody on any ticket. I think he was the most popular uh, American president ever, period. Uh, at least the most popular with very few enemies. Roosevelt was loved, but he was also hated. Still is in many quarters, loved and hated. But Eisenhower kind of was the original Teflon man. When everything went, when anything went well, which it generally did in the 50s, he got credit. When it went bad, they blamed it on his cabinet. Uh, so that was good. But anyway, uh, the Democrats were clearly dominant in that period, uh, show you how dominant all um, overlapping into the next period, between 1954 and 1994, 40 years, between 1954 and 1994, the Democrats continually had a majority in the House of Representatives for over 40 years. The Republicans never won control of the House until Newt Gingrich with his contract with America, and I'm going to get into this on Thursday when Newt introduced a different, more volatile, more personal, more attack-oriented uh, political system. Uh, then the Republicans finally regained control of the House in, after 40 years. And in fact, from 1932 until 1994, the Republicans briefly, and I mean for two years, in 1946, they won barely control of the House and Senate. They lost control back in 1948. They regained it in 1952 for two years, the House and the Senate, because of Eisenhower's coattails. But then in 1954, the Republicans lost control of the House and Senate again, and they never regained control of the House until 1994. So that clearly was an era of Democratic domination. Then in the 1970s, certainly by the time Reagan is elected in 1980, uh, there is a, uh, I will call it uh, an era of two-party competition. The Democrats win sometime, the Republicans win sometime. The only argument I'm going to make that some of you people might not agree, and I'm trying to be fair and balanced, uh, is that a lot of people credit Reagan with breaking this up, giving the Republicans an even keel again, and certainly since 1980, Republicans, if anything, have had a slight edge, slight, on the Democrats, but I really think it was Nixon. Nixon, Nixon, Nixon doesn't get enough credit. Nixon's the one that broke up the Solid South. Nixon uh, brought a lot of Catholics into the Republican Party by, uh, you know, creating in what he called the anti-secular or the anti-secular yeah, anti coalition. I just don't think Nixon gets enough credit. I'm sorry. Uh, he was a much underrated president. I know he did some bad things, but I'm going to be very fair. He did some good things. If you're a liberal, he started the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act. Uh, he gave us wage and price controls. How many Republicans today want wage and price controls? There may be one, but he's dying. Okay, uh, Nixon did a lot of liberal things, and you know, as a Democrat, he scared the bejabbers out of me because he was so successful. If he didn't get involved in that Watergate mess, I, you know, who knows uh, where he'd be ranked today. I had a really intelligent Republican friend who was active in politics, and I said to him, God rest your soul, I said, uh, why do you give Reagan all the credit when it's really Nixon? He said, well, that's because Nixon was from, or Reagan was from California, Nixon wasn't. What? 
He said, what do you mean, what? I said, Nixon wasn't from California. No. See, that's trouble with you. I said, oh, okay. All right, that's a true story. All right. Now, I want to break it down another way. It'll make everything I say in the next two days a little easier to understand. If you want to do ages of dominance, and it's what we've had, from 1800 to 1850s, in other words, from the time of Jefferson till the Civil War almost, which began in 1861, for all intents and purposes, 1860, uh, the Democrats or the Democratic Republicans before them, they dominated. Not only the presidency, but basically Congress, most of the governors, stuff. Now, the, the, the uh, Federalists and the Whigs, uh, they were competitive, but clearly the Jacksonian Party especially uh, was dominant up until the Civil War. Then the Civil War, which was blamed on the Democrats, the Republicans were the party of patriotism, they were the party that opposed secession, they were the party that ended slavery, they took all the credit, deservedly so, and the Republicans clearly became dominant from 1860 to 1930. And what ended that long era of Republican dominance? The Great Depression which began in 1929. So the Republicans' greatest era was ushered in with the election of Lincoln in 1860. Lincoln successfully carried us through the Civil War, uh, ended slavery. I'm going to argue that the Republican platform in 1860 was the greatest political platform ever written, and it was totally, totally fulfilled. I know some of you people are even my age, maybe even a couple older, not many, uh, but Think of any time in your lifetime that a party fulfilled all of its campaign promises. I got to go back to 1860, the Republicans did. And they, they were also the party of patriotism. They always reminded the people that the Democrats were more pro-South. They used to say things like, vote as you shot, scratch a rebel and you'll find a Democrat. And not all Democrats were rebels, but all rebels were Democrats. And they used to wave, now we call it flag waving due to patriotism thing, you know. Uh, the Republicans would wave the bloody shirt, remind the voters in the North, because they had no strength in the South at this time, the Republicans, uh, the, the, that they were the party of patriotism, kept the Union together, ended slavery, and that waving the bloody shirt worked right up until the 1930s when the Civil War generation was finally dying out. All right, so the Republicans dominated then, but then the Depression, come on, Bill. The Depression utter, uh, ushered in the age of the Democrats again from 1932 to 80, uh, although you could argue the 70s were a transition period, though Jimmy Carter was elected in 76. Uh, it was really between 1932 and 1980, there were only two Republicans elected president, uh, Eisenhower and, and, and uh, Nixon. Okay, so, and for most of that era, the Democrats controlled the House and Senate. Most of the governors were Democrat. And in that era, the Democrats had become the dominant party in the South. I'll explain how that happened and how it ended uh, either today or tomorrow. And then since the 1970s, some people say 1980 with this Reagan thing, uh, the, the, the parties have been in more or less parity. Reagan won a landslide in 80, bigger one in 84, uh, Bush won in 88, but then Clinton came in in 92 and 96. Uh, of course, then that disputed election in 20 and 2000, rather. And, you know, it's, it's been give and take since the 1970s. And I, I'll, I'll tell you on Wednesday, Thursday why I think the parties have become so polarized now, why they hate each other so much, uh, much more so than they did in most of these eras, except for the Civil War, of course. Uh, but uh, part of it is because the Cold War ended. When the Cold War ended, we didn't have a common enemy anymore. Think of that. Uh, when the Cold War finally, and I never thought, when I started teaching, I never thought I'd see the end of the Cold War. Never thought I'd see a free Lithuania, for God's sake. Uh, but it all came to pass. But when you don't have a common enemy, sometimes you grow farther apart. Remember that movie, It Came From Outer Space, the flying saucer thing back in the 50s? Remember the guy with cellophane on or, or aluminum foil? And it turned, Michael Rennie, didn't he play the... Well, anyway, the reason that guy came to Earth, if you remember the, the movie, is because we were fighting the communists and it was the Cold War, and he came to scare to be jabbers out of both us and the Russians and join us together. And we did live happily ever after. <laughs> there you go. Now! All right. 
All right. Why the rise of the Republicans? Okay. A real turning point is the Mexican War. Between 18, May of 1846, February of 1848, we fought the Mexican War, and we won it. And we took all of this territory from Mexico. Counting Texas, look, well, we already had Texas, but look. Counting Texas, and you wonder why the Mexicans don't love us, we took 51% of Mexico, 51%. Not counting Texas, just this Mexican session, we took 33% of Mexico, 33%. Then in 1854, the Mexicans willingly sold us for $10 million this land called the Gadsden Purchase, which is the southern part today of western New Mexico, and of course, most of southern Arizona, all of southern Arizona. Tucson's there, Phoenix is almost there. You could see Yuma. Okay? All right. Now, we won all of that stuff. We you know, added immense territory to the United States. What's the bad news? What about slavery out there? Between 1820, with the so called Missouri Compromise, and 1848, when we got all this territory, more or less, the slavery question was swept under the rugs. It wasn't a big issue. Most of the states either then had slavery or didn't. We didn't have a lot of extra territory. But all of a sudden, now we do. What about slavery out there? That's the first question. Right at the end of the Mexican War, in fact, before the war was even over, a guy by the name of David Wilmo, the Wilmo Proviso from Pennsylvania, David Wilmo, made a, 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 move, a, a proposal in Congress that never was enacted, but he said that in any territory we acquire from Mexico, there never be slavery. He said the war was started to please the South. The South said, no, that's not true. He said, all right, then I'm calling your bluff. Promise us that you'll never try to put slavery anywhere out there. And of course, that wasn't going to happen. So between 1848 and 1860, the country was ripped apart by slavery. What about slavery in the so-called Mexican session? We're going to have it, or we're we going to not. And uh, I'll tell you why the Gadsden Purchase, which comes, Mexico willingly sold us that land for $10 million, and they couldn't figure out why we wanted it. Okay, but uh, show you how lucky, Americans are lucky. The, the great German who put together the Second Reich in 1870s, uh, Otto von Bismarck, said, God takes care of three kinds of people and makes them lucky, fools, drunks, and Americans. And Otto was a smart man. And I, when I heard that, I figured, I'm going right to Vegas. At that time, you had to go to Vegas. So I went out to Vegas, figuring I'm all three. I had to really win. Uh, didn't work. But I did go out in a $10,000 car and came back in a $500,000 bus. So, uh, <laughs> see, we, met, we Lithuanians have a problem with with blackjack, because you have to count to 21. Uh, okay, but anyway, what about slavery there? Okay, and that's going to cause the Civil War. So in a way, the Mexican War caused the what? Civil War. If I were teaching this course in Mexico, I'd say, all right, the gringo took half our land, and he only lost about 12,000 people in the war, most of them to disease, and he took half our land. But they, they started arguing about slavery in that land, and 12 years later, their civil war started, and that little war cost the gringo 600,000 lives. No war was deadlier than the civil war. When I first started teaching on a college level by myself in 1970, I could say this truthfully, and it's still almost true, the American, more Americans died in the civil war than all the rest of our wars put together. In 1970, at the heart of Vietnam, that was still true. Now, when you throw Vietnam and all these wars we've been in since, when you throw that in, no. But still, almost as many Americans, because you count the North and South, all right? And then 600,000 Americans, North or South, died in that Civil War. All right, what were the answers to slavery in the territory? Abolition. Almost nobody was an abolitionist. Get rid of slavery. Get rid of it. Don't let it into the Mexican territory, but eventually, get, or immediately, whatever, get rid of it even in the 15 states that had it. Just get rid of slavery.
period. It's wrong. It's, it's against the Bible. Against the Bible. It's in the Bible constantly. I never understood that argument. All right, but anyway, get rid of slavery. Abolish it. Now, very, very few people were abolitionists. In the South, obviously, hardly anybody was an abolitionist. And in the North, almost nobody was. Well, why in the North? Well, the rich people didn't want to aggravate the South because who was the best product? Who were, who were the best customers for American manufactured products of the North? The South, right? And the Northern workers who worked in those factories wanted to save their jobs, so they didn't want the South to stop buying their products. But also, if the, if the four million slaves were freed, theoretically they'd be free to come North and what? Compete for your job. So most Northerners were against abolition. Many abolitionists were mobbed. A couple were killed by mobs uh, in the 1830s and 40s. The abolitionists were not popular people, and there were very, very few abolitionists. What the most Democrats, especially in the North, said, and this is going to be important when I get into the Kansas-Nebraska Act in a couple minutes, popular sovereignty. This sounds like the all-American way to do it, but it had a lot of strings. Let the people in each territory decide what to do about slavery. You ever hear this? Take it out of the hands of the politicians in Washington. Let the people decide, right? All right let the people in California, let the people in Utah, New Mexico, uh, in whatever. Let them in Kansas became the big thing. Let them decide what to do about slavery. Have a vote. If you want slavery, fine. If you don't want it, fine. Either way. Who cares? Popular sovereignty. Let the people be king. Uh, and that, yeah, that might be all right, except the Southerners argued, and let me, uh, except the Southerners argued that slaves were property, and you had to allow people to take property into the territories, because it was, it's like you could take your horse or a wagon into the territory, or, you know, or whatever, then you could take your slave, which was your property in the territory. So not, uh, popular sovereignty really never caught on in the South. Uh, and it had a lot of drawbacks, but it sounded like an all-American way to do things. Then the Republicans, and Lincoln and the original Republicans, were not abolitionists, were not. They could never have won diddly as abolitionists. They were non-extensionists. That's what made the Republican Party. That was its main promise in 1856 and 1860 when they elected their first president, Lincoln. All right, what was non-extension? Let slavery alone where it is. In the 15 states that had it, Fine and dandy. If they want to keep it from now till ever, fine. They want to get rid of it, fine. It's their business. But don't let it what? Extend in any new territory. So no new slave states. The states that had it, Lincoln made clear, I'll never touch slavery there. First of all, I can't. Second of all, I won't. I'm not that stupid. Okay? But don't let it extend in any new territories. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. He made no step toward abolishing slavery until the middle of the Civil War in 1863, in January 1st, with the Emancipation Proclamation. And even then, he freed the slaves only in those states then in rebellion. And 99% of the states were, or slaves were where? In the states in rebellion. So were the people in Georgia and Alabama going to say, oh, President Lincoln said, get rid of our slaves. Go ahead, scoop. We're fighting a damn war. So the Emancipation Proclamation freed not a single slave. Not one. Zero. Zero. To think that it did is fake news. There you go. All right. And the slave states, of course, wanted extension of slavery. They argued simply that slaves were property. It had to be allowed in the territory, same as taking your wagon into the territories. And in 1857 a Supreme Court decision called Dred Scott. In that decision, uh, the Supreme Court said that that's right, that slaves are property and they have to be allowed in the territories. And by implication, in fact, if you had slaves, you could take them into free states because of the reciprocal thing. If I have a driver's license from Delaware, it's good in where? California, right? So if I had a slave in Alabama, by the Dred Scott decision, if you took it to its logical conclusion, then I could take it uh, in, in a Pennsylvania or New York or wherever. Fair enough? So those were the four answers uh, to what to do about slavery in the territories. And eventually most Northerners picked up with non-extension. And when Lincoln won, he carried every free state except part of New Jersey, and that was enough to have him elected. But he carried no southern states. In fact, he was hated in the South. <coughs> and the Republicans were the first major party that was completely sectional. And the South made it clear that if a Republican were ever elected president, they'd leave the Union. 
And the Republicans made it clear, if you tried that, we're going to stop you, and that's going to be the what? Civil War. Lincoln was elected in November of 1860. By December, a month later, six weeks later, the southern states, led by South Carolina and Lindsey Graham, began, <laughs> began to secede. A Nikki Haley was for MP, uh, secession, then against it, then she wasn't quite. All right, uh, but, uh, but, but, but anyway, there you go. Now, what brings on the Republican Party? The most catastrophic act in the history of Congress, and if anybody tells you anything else, they're wrong. There, and I have a PhD, so huh. <laughs> was the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, which was sponsored by Stephen Douglas, who's gonna have the debates with Lincoln tomorrow. All right, why did Douglas do it? What did it do? And what was the role of the know-nothings, uh, which really was a third party, sometimes called the American Party, and you're going to hear about nativism, birtherism, all this in 1856. Sound familiar? No, nothing's wanted to build, keep immigrants out, especially from Ireland. They're going to build a wall all across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> and you know who was going to pay for that wall? <laughs> Ireland! <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's do the Kansas-Nebraska Act. All right, that's the election. Okay. Why did Douglas sponsor the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854? All right, by 1854, and it was something the Republicans promised in 1856 and 60 and delivered on, and delivered on, was the building of a transcontinental railroad. Here was our frontier line at that time. And California already was a booming state because of the gold rush. No sooner, in fact, even just before Mexico gave us California at the end of the war, what was discovered in California? Gold. Right? Remember we were the golden state? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we, we didn't want California going its own way. Now some people would like to see. All right. Uh, there are, there's a political faction back east. I guarantee you would let California go. Right, but anyway, California uh, was a very booming state, obviously. And it was so isolated, though. How were we going to get people from this frontier line out to California? We tried many things. Wagon trains. You remember that Ward Bond thing? Wagon train. Yeah, he always made it in... Uh, Six weeks, you know, it's a little longer than that. Uh, you know, Jefferson Davis, who was Secretary of War in the 1850s, later became President of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis actually imported camels from Africa, and he, the Army had a camel corps. Yeah, because he figured camels could take people to California and bring the gold back. All right, that didn't work. Camels didn't take to American mule whippers uh, too well. Camels are very ornery people. Heck, they own a tobacco company, don't they? All right. So anyway, the way we were going to do it is by a transcontinental railroad. Not a question. You're going to build a transcontinental railroad, which we would complete in 1869, funded by the Republican Party. Good. But where was the eastern end of it going to be? Were we going to come from New Orleans through Texas? And that's why we bought the gadgets and purchase through this area here in L.A., which was hooked up to San Francisco and the gold fields, right? The southern route. That's what Jefferson Davis and most Democrats wanted to please the south, build a transcontinental from the south through the Gadsden Purchase area in L.A., San Diego, which was already hooked up to San Francisco. So it would be a way to do it. Douglas was a senator from Illinois. So where did he want the railroad? He wanted it to go this way, from Chicago, roughly where Route 80 is today, from Chicago all the way through directly into the San Francisco uh, gold fields. Fair enough? So the north tended to favor that route. The South wanted this route, and the guy behind the Gadsden Purchase of 1854 was none other than Jefferson Davis, who was Secretary of War under President Pierce, who didn't know he was president, but, all right, uh, Jeff, you're, or Frank, you're president. Well, what? Of the United States. Okay, but uh, anyhow, so uh, what, which way are we going to go? The problem Douglas faced, and I hope I'm not going too fast, this area here, which became Kansas and Nebraska, that was unorganized territory. What did that mean? This area here was all organized, including the Gadsden Purchase. New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, they were already organized. 
If it was unorganized territory, the land wasn't surveyed adequately, meaning you would be at very great risk if you bought land there. Many settlers were unwilling to move into the plush area of what would become Kansas because they were afraid of claim jumping and stuff like that. So what Douglas wanted to do in 1854 to enhance the possibility of a railroad going that way, his idea was to organize this unorganized area into two territories, Kansas and Nebraska. Now, what was the problem? Both of those were north of the 36 degree, 30 minute north latitude line. The famous 3630 line, 36 degrees, 36 and a half degrees, 3630. The uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820 had said that any territory in this area north of 3630 would never have slavery. So, why should the South vote to organize this territory, set up a competing route for the railroad, because then the railroads could get land grants and surveyed land, and it was understood that any railroad crazy enough to build out there would be given lucrative land grants to encourage it. And they couldn't get those land grants until the territory was what? Organized, right? Okay, so organize the territory, Kansas and Nebraska. Sounds like a good football game, Kansas and Nebraska. Okay, problem. Why should the South go along with that when there couldn't be what? Slavery there. So Douglas had to sweeten the pie. Douglas said, all right, to get Southern votes, which he absolutely knew needed, and to get the support of President Pierce, who was what they called a doe-faced Democrat. A doe-faced was a Northern man with Southern principles. <laughs> Pierce was from New Hampshire, but he favored the South, he favored slavery, so he was a what? Doe-faced. And Pierce would never approve the Kansas-Nebraska Act without some concession to the South. And, of course, the South wouldn't go along, Democrats or Whigs. So, what Douglas said, we'll organize Kansas and Nebraska, we'll repeal the Missouri Compromise, repeal the 36-30 line, and now those areas will determine slavery on the basis of popular sovereignty. The South, mistakenly, thought this meant Nebraska would become a free state, Kansas would become, which was due west of slave Missouri, Kansas would become a what? Slave state. That's not what Douglas said. He said what? Popular sovereignty. But the South misinterpreted that. They, they took the bait. They wanted Kansas so bad they could taste it. So they approved the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Douglas got it through Congress. Pierce readily signed the Kansas-Nebraska Act in May of 1854 and then all kind of hell broke loose. People start flocking into Kansas now, but most of them that moved to Kansas were like the people who move west generally, poor working class white people who own no what? Slaves. If I were successful back in Pennsylvania, doing well, why would I move to Kansas? I wouldn't, right? Stay right where I was. So most of the people that move west all along, from Ohio to Kansas to California, most of the people who moved west were working class white stiffs who owned no slaves. And they didn't want to face the competition of what? Slave labor. So it became obvious that Kansas and Nebraska wanted to become what? Free states. Now the South got upset. Pierce got upset. He was succeeded by another doe-faced Democrat, uh, James Buchanan. And so Buchanan and Pierce did everything they could to bring Kansas in as a free state. It didn't work. Uh, eventually, Kansas became uh, a slave state. Kansas eventually, when the South left the Union, became a free state, and it entered the Union during the Civil War. But anyway, uh, 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 an undeclared civil war broke out in Kansas. Hundreds of people were killed in fighting between pro-Southern slaveryites and anti-slavery Northerners in Kansas called Bleeding Kansas. Uh, terrible situation. John Brown, that crazy guy, he went out to Kansas and hacked people to death. Uh, there were multiple killings, burnings, towns were burned to the ground. It was just terrible. Uh, and, and it was, and now theoretically, though, that area had been barred to slavery, now it was open. So what happened? In the north, and I stress, in the north, a tremendous anti-Kansas-Nebraska Act movement took place in the summer of 1854. We have never before, had never before, have never since, and probably never will, see an explosion like this. All through the north, groups got together. There were mass meetings, sometimes five and 10,000 people. Say what, more than that go to a high school football game now. Yeah, but try to get 10,000 people together in a rural area. 
I mean, say you had to go 10 miles, you had to go by horseback, by wagon, whatever. But all through the north, especially in the Great Lakes states where people were itching to move west, tens of thousands of people attended meetings. And they, they protested the Kansas-Nebraska Act because they wanted non-extension. They didn't want slavery out here. So all of a sudden, non-extension made what? Sense. And these meetings, these mass meetings, everybody said, look, the Democrats are pro-South. Yeah, even the Northern Democrats like Pierce and Buchanan, they're pro-South. The Whigs are going away. So what we got to do is form a new what? A new party. And in the summer of 1854-55, in and at 55, was born the Republican Party. By 1855, the Republicans were on a roll. By 1856, they had elected congressmen and senators and governors. By 1856, they almost damn near won the presidency. I'm going to get into that. Almost. And by 1860, they what? They did, but they were a purely northern party. They were hated in the south. But the Republicans figured out if they carried every free state, they didn't need the what? They didn't need the south. So the Republicans exploded. As a major party, and they've been around ever since in 1854-55. By 1856, they were extremely competitive, elected a Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, <laughs> she was in her first term. Okay. Uh, How come you laughed at that one more than my other one? All right. So anyway, the Kansas-Nebraska Act creates the Republican Party. But let me just review this quickly, and I'll let you go. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, in essence, destroys what's left of the Whig Party. Because every Southern Whig favored the Kansas-Nebraska Act in Congress, every Northern Whig opposed it. The Kansas-Nebraska Act temporarily split the Democratic Party in the Northern and Southern Democrats. It created a new party called the what? Republicans. That was the first major party in American history that was completely sectional. And the South made it clear, you elect a Republican, we're out of here. So in essence, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, by creating the Republican Party and electing Lincoln in 1860, that caused the what? Civil War. Now why did Douglas, such a brilliant guy, such a great politician, he put Mitch McConnell and Nancy to shame with his genius, why did, why did he do it? Because he thought most people didn't give a damn about slavery. He didn't. He hated all. Douglas was equal opportunity hater. He hated all blacks, slave or free. He kept using the word, if you free the blacks, they're going to miscegenate. You know what that means? Interracial marriage. And Douglas was a racist racist. Hell, he made George Wallace look liberal. All right? <laughs> Lincoln was not a flaming civil rights activist, but compared to Douglas, he certainly looked it. Uh, many Northern Democrats felt like Douglas did, for sure. Right? But anyway, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is, has what a great impact. Destroys the Whigs. There, there would be no Whig party by 1856 creates the Republicans, splits the Democrats, opens the way for the Republicans to win in 1860 on a policy of non-extension, and therefore causes the Civil War. Now tomorrow when I come back, I want, I'm going to talk about the election of 1856, and the Republicans did carry most of the North, not Pennsylvania, which was Buchanan will win that election. I'll go over this slowly tomorrow, I promise. Buchanan will win by carrying the whole South, as you can see, California and a couple critical northern states, mainly what? Pennsylvania, which was then the second, had the second most electoral votes. All right, so the Democrats win in 1856, but they're not going to, I'll get into this later. But since you laughed, oh, was Buchanan our first gay president? Yes, he was. You better bet your bippy. Uh, never married. I just read a book said he had an annulment, baloney. Uh, he never married, wasn't a Catholic, so he didn't need an annulment, only us Catholics. We can't get divorced because it would be a sin. And I can't conjugate a verb because it would be a sin. All right, there was Buchanan's partner, William Rufus Devane King. All right, since you laughed, and I'm going to let you go in one minute, talk about a, a very beautiful woman that captivates 1850. More about her tomorrow. Hell, I'm almost falling in love with her looking at her. Uh, wait, don't quite cut me off. Yeah? Uh, all right. <laughs> the Fremonts were the power couple of the 1850s. Her dad was a senator. Oh, the, I'll get into it tomorrow. I'm going to do a lot tomorrow, aren't I? All right, there's the real power couple. You think Trump's running the country? Baloney. They're the two running the country. Sleep well tonight.
I'll get there tomorrow. Ah, the Republicans were always good looking. They were the main candidates in 1860. All right, I'm getting to something. I'm getting to something. Since you were laughing. Come on. Come on. All right, you have dirty minds. We'll get. Oh, no. Okay. Clinton and Newt would never cheat on their wives, would they? Clint, no, couldn't. He was, oh, he's a Catholic now, but he wasn't then, so he could. Okay. All right. That's why Kennedy never cheated. He was Catholic. <laughs> All right. That was my senior prom day. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking. Doc, you could have done better. But she was only the fourth best-looking girl in my class, but she was the best-looking Catholic. So Father Al told me I had to take her. <laughs> Come on. You didn't know her last year? You don't know her this year? That's Nancy Pelosi. Nancy D'Alessandro. No. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now I see a lot of you dirty old men changing your minds on her. <laughs> yes, sir. That's Nancy D'Alessandro. She was in a Miss Maryland contest. Her dad was mayor of Baltimore. So was her brother. I'm telling you. Okay. And I couldn't ask her because she was, oh yes, she was. Uh, she was Italian Catholic. That's why she never lies. <laughs> and that's why she doesn't hate. <laughs> All right, see you tomorrow. Thanks a lot. <laughs>